Here we are for our second to last episode. In episode 3, we studied calendars, eclipses, and cat together. This time we will consider the role of religion in ancient Greece. Then in the astronomy section, learn more about the moon. After that, we will show you how the celestial object was remarkably well represented in the Antikythera mechanism. Having an awareness of ancient Greek people's religion is extremely important as it was a very significant aspect of their culture and daily life, and therefore it necessarily shaped their thinking. Let's consider how that might have influenced the builders of the Antikythera mechanism. Ancient Greeks' rich mythology is relatively popular. Most people will have heard of the Minotaur, Odysseus, Hercules, or gods like Zeus or Aphrodite. A lot of you will also be familiar with the so-called pity of Delphi, a woman thought to communicate with the gods through trances. Another way of understanding omens from the gods that dates back to the Babylonians again is by interpreting the sky. It was also thought to reveal information about individuals, i.e. horoscopes. We've briefly mentioned astrology when talking about zodiac constellations, and we've already met Ptolemy, a contemporary to the Antikythera mechanism, whose Almagest was a reference in astronomy for a thousand years after him. His less famous text Tetra Biblos still provides a theoretical framework to astrologers today. Broadly, it's divided into astrology principles, mundane astrology, or how celestial events influence terrestrial ones, and individual horoscopes. We have to acknowledge that astrology was treated as a science in its own right. In the first chapters of his work, Ptolemy defends his subject, notably by arguing that it provides a basis for self-reflection and self-knowledge to quote him what is fitting and expedient for the capabilities of each temperament. A science also needs methods and techniques. This would mainly consist of monitoring the sky in order to make predictions once the motion of the relevant celestial objects is understood. A tool we use a lot nowadays to better grasp the phenomenon is modeling. It's partially why we want to build a replica, so that our audience can interact with this model. It is possible that devices like the Antikythera mechanism we used to figure out what the sky would be like, or would have been like at some point in time, from the positions of planets or the moon phase, astrological interpretations could be inferred. This hypothesis could only come from an interdisciplinary perspective. Present scientists might ignore the topic of astrology or religion in general, labeling it as superstitious. Nevertheless, this aspect of ancient cultures is not negligible and can lead to new explanations about an artifact. Let's keep that in mind when we go on to study the moon. One of the most visible and obvious celestial cycles after the alteration between day and night is the moon appearing and disappearing. In more scientific terms, we can easily observe the different phases of our natural satellite, from new moon to full moon. Last time, we considered the moon's role in eclipses and how that's described thanks to cycles. We mentioned the popular expression blood moon, but what about the blue moon, harvest moon, or even the honeymoon? Those are all somehow related to the celestial object. For example, in honeymoon, the moon refers to a short period of time, one month, in which the couple sees everything as honeysuit. There is also the opposite idiom many moons ago that suggests that something happened many months, if not years, ago. Okay, but this is somewhat related to the idea of cycles that we discussed with the eclipses. Turning to astrology, which we just discussed in our history section, the full moons of each month have been nicknamed and assigned characteristics in some cultures, especially the Native American one. However, a lunar or synodic month is only about 29.5 days long, which means that every two or three years, there's an extra full moon, the blue moon. 
The name is actually an English invention that has nothing to do with the color of the moon. It's often found in the idiom, once in a blue moon, which means something happens even less often than many moons ago. For the last expression you mentioned at the start, it's a bit more complex. The harvest moon is a name given to the full moon closest to the autumn equinox. Of course, the name does have a relationship with crop reaping. The harvest moon rises at dusk, which means that farmers can harvest their crops for longer. This special moon has been noticed by many different cultures. You might have eaten a mooncake during the Chinese mid-autumn festival. The astronomical explanation behind the harvest moon is that for observers in the northern hemisphere, close to the autumn equinox, the moon rises nearly at the same time as the night before. That is because then, the moon's orbital motion has its largest northward component, and for northern observers, this implies that the moon will draw a longer arc across the sky and will be visible for a longer time above the horizon. On average, during the year, the moon rises 50 minutes later each day. But during the harvest moon, it takes only 30 minutes longer. So the moon will rise near the sunset for a few nights in a row. Again, this is very useful for farmers. The last stunning appearance of the moon we are presenting here is the supermoon. This again has to do with the moon's orbit, albeit with a different aspect. Like the planets, the moon's orbit is an ellipse and not a perfect circle. When the moon is closest to Earth, at its perigee, it appears larger. This is particularly impressive when it coincides with a full moon. More precisely, it's when a full moon is within 10% of its perigee that it's called a supermoon, which happens twice or thrice a year. The micromoon is the opposite, when the moon is at its apogee. What's most interesting about this is that the ancient Greeks were very well aware of the moon's apparent size changing. Hipparchus devised his eccentric theory to resolve this soon before the Antikythera mechanism was built. Now that we understand how the moon turns, we can examine how it's modeled in the mechanism and how we deal with it in our replica. The moon train creators found a clever way to mechanically represent the variable motion of the moon. This variable motion has two components, the moon elliptical orbit and the anomalistic month. The anomalistic month is the average time it takes for the moon to return to an abscess, apogee or perigee. It takes the moon longer to return to the same abscess because that has moved ahead during one revolution, a phenomenon known as apsidal precession. So the average anomalistic month is 27.55 days instead of the 27.32 days for the mean sidereal month. The time it takes for the moon to return to the same position with respect to the background of apparently fixed stars. Each of the components has its own input in the mechanism, and we will dissect what these components are and how they are represented. We have seen that the moon travels in an elliptical orbit around the Earth. This means that it will speed up and slow down as it rotates around the Earth. This is the principle behind Kepler's second law which states that a line joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time, and can be similarly applied to the Earth-Moon system. The first input to the mechanical model of this elliptical motion is the sidereal month. This drives a gear that is placed on the E-platform in the mechanism. The gear has a pin on it. Another gear, which has a slot that fits in the pin, is placed just above this pin gear and is slightly offset, one millimeter to be exact. This arrangement results in the two gears rotating together at variable speeds, and so the slot gear models the elliptical motion of the moon pretty accurately. The second input drives the E-platform itself. One full rotation of this platform represents 8.88 .8 years, which is the rotation period of the line of apsides so that this makes up for the anomalistic month. Now we need to combine both of these inputs to produce an accurate model of the motion of the moon. The pin and slot gearing is mounted epicyclically 
on the platform, and the compounded rotational motion is then outputted on the dial at the front of the mechanism. In this episode, we started by recognizing the role astrology might have played in the construction of the Ampicatera mechanism. Then you learn the astronomical significance behind expressions involving the moon, whose representation on the mechanism we sought to explain in the engineering section. Next time, we will conclude by looking at the implications of such an advanced device for antiquity, the significance of the equinox and solstices for ancient cultures generally, and explain how we will proceed to manufacture our replica. <laughs>